Well, the word rest is misleading. The dictionary gives you several different meanings. Its primary meaning is the cessation of movement, to come to rest. It implies motion that's now stopped, that something has stopped. Cessation of movement or action. Or the equivalent, cessation of labor. It's when you're through with your job, you rest. doesn't mean you're relaxing or sleeping. It means you're no longer hammering those nails or whatever. You've, you've come to the end of that task. It's a state of freedom from exertion in that sense. It can be freedom of anxiety. come to rest in a sense of freedom from anxiety, of emotional anxiety. It can also be, it can refer to the repose of sleep uh, that refreshes your body and so forth, or the repose of death. It sometimes uses that term when someone is, is, is uh, uh, been freed from earthly toil altogether. These are a different meaning. What's being used here? What's the rest being offered here? See, it's possible that the faith of these Jewish believers that this is written to is going to be tried because of the persecution that they're starting to undertake uh, at the time this, apostle, this epistle is being written. And uh, because of their present situation, they too can fall short just as the people at Kadesh Barnea fell short. They can fall short of what God wants them to attain in this life. And the promise of God's rest here is still available to them and us because it was never totally fulfilled. The promise of rest in the Old Testament was unfulfilled and it was not withdrawn is the point. It's available to those who want it now. The entire purpose of this letter to the, uh, to the Hebrews is to get the Jewish believers to enter in to the fullness of what God has available to them. And the writer uses two different words for rest in this chapter. The primary one he uses is the word kataposis, which is used eight times in chapters 3 and 4. And uh, outside of the book of Hebrews, this word is used only once in the entire New Testament. That's in the book of Acts. But the word in all these uses means the cessation of activity. It means rest in the sense of ceasing. We want you to cease your own works and, not, and rely only on his. The Septuagint includes notable passages where the word for rest, kataposis, in connection with Israel's possession of the land is clearly paralleled all through the Old Testament with a word, kleronomia, which is um, inheritance. The word for rest and inheritance in the Old Testament sense are virtually synonyms. So what they forfeited there was their inheritance of the land. See, for them, their rest was their inheritance, and Moses clearly shows that for Israel, their rest was the inheritance of the land, the land of Canaan. In the same way, the term rest was the writer's functional equivalent for a Christian's inheritance. Now, the Christian's in promise isn't the land, it's something else, but whatever it is, it's something that has to be earned by faithfulness. The Christians uh, are heirs, is all through the uh, Scripture and all through the Epistle of Hebrews, that there we're heirs too. It's affirmed before, back in chapter 1, and it's going to be reaffirmed again in chapter 6 and elsewhere. Moses showed that Israel's rest was their inheritance, and that same thing's true for you and I. Our rest is our inheritance. That begs the question, okay, what is our inheritance? And uh, see, these Jewish believers that this is written to had severed the relationship to their established systems by ba being baptized. When they, were, when they baptized them publicly, that was their way of closing the door on Judaism and committing themselves to the Lordship of Christ. That's what the baptism signified there, and that's going to be emphasized when we get to chapter 10. The renunciation of the established Judaism is what has incurred the wrath of their establishment community. And they all were undergoing intense persecution, and that's what prompts them to consider going back under that Judaism umbrella, and that's what is being denied them by the writer of the Hebrew, uh, the epistle here. He points out, and they have not yet been martyred, but they will, and many will face that possibility. We're already ahead, probably had that experience. But if they're going to mingle with those that are observing established rituals in the temple, those persecuting them, the concept was that they might forget that they had previously renounced it by their baptism. So by pretending they're still in Judaism, they thought they could avoid. But that's in effect denying Christ. And that's a tough spot to realize that they're in. And there's analogies today. 
Even Paul, by the way, had observed Jewish rituals as memorials to Christ during his ministry. We see that in Acts and mentioned 1 Corinthians. So, because of all this, many of these were not assembling with other believers, but were trying to re-identify themselves with established Judaism in order to escape persecution. That's what the writer is arguing against. And just like their ancestors back at Kedosh Barnea, the recipients of this epistle had a promise of God of entering into His rest. This is not the rest of salvation in the sense of justification, because they're already recognized as believers. And it's also not the future millennial rest in which all persecution will cease. Therefore, we can conclude that the rest is that faith life rest which the believer enters by faith, in which he enjoys the inheritance that God gives to those that are faithful. That's resting from our attempts and relying on the Holy Spirit's leading. So we have the Hebrew Christians here before. Prior to that, we have Psalm 95 and all alluding to the rest, what we call the Canaan rest. The offer is still open, and the today is, is as we've indicated. But unto us, for, in chapter 4, we're starting to make some progress in 4 now. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, these readers were without excuse because they had the gospel preached unto them. And again, he draws a parallel to Numbers 13 and 14. Twelve men came back from the promised land and gave a report. And the children of Israel made a wrong decision as a result of that. These Jewish believers had received a message from twelve apostles. Remember there's twelve, tri- twelve apostles that are going to rule on twelve thrones over the twelve tribes. you the- got to remember the Jewishness of all that. The emphasis here is on the necessity of faith to attain spiritual blessings from an inheritance. He continues, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they, shall, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now there's a change of term here. The quote here is, speaks of my rest. What rest is that? That's a creation rest, because God is speaking to the rest he took. When did God cease his works. Genesis 2. The creation was finished. God finished it. And he didn't, he, he didn't go to sleep. He didn't, he didn't take a nap. No, he just stopped creating. That's where most of us, that's, uh, well, we, actually, uh, we get into the whole entropy laws, which really were introduced in response to Genesis 3. But he says, my rest, it is referring to God's creation rest. For we, we which have believed do enter into a rest. The statement that we who have believed uses the past tense and refers to the writer and the readers. They have already entered in to that, to that part of it. They do enter into a rest. The author then switches to present tense. We who do now enter into that rest, presently entering into that spiritual rest. So this paradigm, he's going to point out that the final facet of the rest, the final facet is yet future. There's part of this past, there's part of it present, there's part of the future. We're going to discover the, the, uh, that paradigm uh, going on again. The point is that because they have believed, they have begun to enter into his creation rest through the final facet, although the f- final facet is still yet future. These Jewish believers must continue to exercise faith to enjoy what this rest has to offer. The writer again points out that the wilderness generation did not enter the rest even though God had, pos- had possessed it since the creation. God, through the psalmist David, announced the continued existence of the future rest. So he spoke in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise. He, if he was four, is pointing out, the, now introducing an, the analogy, not just back to the David, back to Genesis 2. He spake of a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, that God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. What is rest implying here? Ceasing from your works, okay? Works in the sense of where you're trying to earn your salvation. You can't do that. God has done it all. And that's really what we're talking about resting from. This is a reference to Genesis 2. The word here, by the way, is Shabbat, which means to cease, desist, or rest. So again, we have, the, we have these previous rests that we looked at so far. So far, we we're alluding back to the Canaan rest. But now we've introduced a deeper allusion here that goes even before Kadesh Barnea. And that's Genesis 2. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, and this was that God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if in this place now, if they shall enter into my rest. So he's used that word, if they. Again, there's an if, there's a condition on this particular rest. 
The authors just link God's Sabbath rest at the time of creation with the rest that the Israelites missed in the desert. Somehow, conceptually, they have something in common. That's what he's focusing on. The typology of the salvation rest is used to show that Israel failed to enter into the rest by what? By divine decree, because God swore an oath. So God could not repent or change it. They had to do what he indicated. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Israel failed to enter in because of unbelief. Nevertheless, the invitation to enter God's rest remains open. It remaineth that some must enter in. So it's still open. Who's it open to? Those are going to be faithful. It remaineth that some must enter therein. Now let's summarize all this. Though, through an exposition from the Old Testament concept of rest, the author exhorted them to hold fast to what? To their confidence in Christ. This was meant to encourage them to face the hardships boldly as the day approaches. What day? When the land would be burned, that's going to be, uh, show up in uh, Hebrews 6, and when the temple worship will disappear, and that's going to be predicted in Hebrews 8. So this is a very contemporary letter specifically tailored to those 38 years between Christ's ministry and the fall of Jerusalem. But it has lessons for all of us. That's why it's here. Using Psalm 95, the author warned that the lack of faith and confidence in Christ could jeopardize their rest. Similar to what happened to the Exodus generation, potentially resulting in their loss of physical life. Potentially losing physical life. God's rest refers to Israel's worship before the personal presence of yod heh in Psalm 95, which could be forfeited by hardened, rebellious hearts like those of the Exodus generation. What we want to make sure we don't have is hardened hearts where we fail to enter into the promises He's of inheritance he's given us. The readers could still enter into his rest by continuing to place their faith in the life-sustaining presence of God. And the offer of rest is not limited to the Exodus generation because it was first experienced by Adam and Eve in the garden after God rested. And you can get into that by taking, taking a look at chapter, uh, Exodus two, uh, Genesis 2. Neither was it limited to the occupation of the land under Joshua because David himself, see, it wasn't limited to Adam and Eve, it wasn't just limited to the... Uh, the uh, Exodus generation, Numbers 14, no, because David reoffers it, if you will, in Psalm 95, and it's here underscored for us, in effect, in the New Testament, in the Epistle to Hebrews. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, if so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. This is verse 7 continuing. And so the failure of the Israelites did not nullify that some will enter into that rest. Accordingly, God renewed the offer as late as the time of David. That's important to us. At that time, God call, set, again set a certain day, calling it today, presenting this opportunity to all readers of the psalm for whom today becomes their own today. What's our today? Our today is right now. And uh, today, today, today. So this is, we have it today also. And if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So see, the Old Testament could have been quoted by many, to show that the rest had already been uh, entered via the conquest of the land. Josh, that, that, that many people would argue that's foreclosed it. But this is a rebuttal to that, because the writer's rebuttal is simple and sufficient. If it had been so, God would not have spoken later, later about another day. So it's still open, is the point. And the psalm, the psalm which you know, forms this text disproves any notion that the test had already been entered into and was no longer open. So... There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now he turns away from the Canaan rest now to focus on the Sabbath rest. A different Greek word is now used here for this chapter, uh, in this chapter for this rest, uh, sapatismos. And uh, it's only used here in the entire New Testament. It's uh, found elsewhere in Greek literature, uh, but in each case it refers not to the Sabbath day as we think of it, but rather the Sabbath observance or celebration. The view that's emphasized here is that of a celebration. And uh, that's a very interesting perspective. We so often think of this, keeping the Sabbath in the, from the Judaistic legalistic view. Don't do this and don't do that. Most of us fail, and some of them fail, to really get the spirit of the Sabbath, which is to celebrate the creation of God. And we can even do that today, is to celebrate the creation of God. And uh, Sabbatismos. It's, it's the emphasis not the cessation of daily activities, but rather the unhindered opportunity for the people to celebrate God's self-sustaining presence among them. That's really the thrust of the Sabbath rest 
even in Judaism, if it's done properly. And as such, the Sabbath celebration was meant to be a time of festive praise, including special sacrifices commemorating God's provisions. And that's really what the Sabbath is supposed to be all about, not following 613 rules or whatever. Its origin in creation suggests that his Sabbath celebration transcends the rest forfeited by the Exodus generation and enjoyed under David and Joshua. So this rest remains available today to everyone that believes, if we understand what it really embraces. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So this is in effect the ultimate refutation of what we would call legalism. Trying to please God by following rules is not the point. That's striving fleshly rather than resting in the leading of the Spirit, which is what he's talking about. Ceased from their own works. Entering into God's rest here is ceasing from our works and uh, our own works. We need to model our lives after Jesus Christ, who is faithful to the one who appointed him, as mentioned earlier in Hebrews 3, and must be careful to hold firmly to, until the end, to the end, the confidence we had at the first. Only then would they be able to rest from the works in the joyful possession of their inheritance in the Messianic kingdom. And by the way, that's a key thought now starting to merge out of all of this. The ultimate rest, the ultimate inheritance is in the, king, the Messianic kingdom. And many people fail to appreciate the book of Hebrews because they don't recognize its, its uh, focus on the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant which, of course, is what we call the millennium. So here's some of it. We have the creation rest in Genesis 2. We have the Canaan rest that's alluded to not only in Kiddush, but in the Psalm and also in this epistle. But the ultimate rest is the millennial rest, which is indeed, of course, yet future all the way. Cessation of movement or action. Or the equivalent, cessation of labor. It's when you're through with your job, you rest. doesn't mean you're relaxing or sleeping. It means you're no longer hammering those nails or whatever. You've, you've come to the end of that task. It's a state of freedom from exertion in that sense. It can be freedom of... You come to rest in a sense of freedom from anxiety, of emotional anxiety. It can also be... It can refer to the repose of sleep... Uh, that refreshes your body and so forth, or the repose of death. It sometimes uses that term when someone is, is, is uh, uh, been freed from earthly toil altogether. These are a different me. What's being used here? What's the rest being offered here? See, it's possible that the faith of these Jewish believers that this is written to is going to be tried because of the persecution that they're starting to undertake uh, at the time this, apostle, uh, this epistle is being written. And uh, because of their present situation, they too can fall short just as the people at Kadesh Barnea fell short. They can fall short of what God wants them to attain in this life. And the promise... Well, the word rest is misleading. The dictionary gives you several different meanings. Its primary meaning is the cessation of movement, to come to rest. It implies motion that's now stopped, that something is stopped. Of God's rest here is still available to them and us because it was never totally fulfilled. The promise of rest in the Old Testament was unfulfilled and it was not withdrawn is the point. It's available to those who want it now. The entire purpose of this letter to the, uh, to the Hebrews is to get the Jewish believers to enter in